The Literary Life of Thingambob Esquire by Edgar Allan Poe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Literary Life of Thingambob Esquire, late editor of the Goose the Room Foodle, by himself. I am now growing in years, and, since I understand that Shakespeare and Mr. Emmons are deceased, it is not impossible that I may even die. It has occurred to me, therefore, that I may as well retire from the field of letters and repose upon my laurels. But I am ambitious of signalizing my abdication of the literary scepter by some important bequest to posterity, and perhaps I cannot do a better thing than just pen for it an account of my earlier career. My name, indeed, has been so long and so constantly before the public eye that I am not only willing to admit the naturalness of the interest which it has everywhere excited, but ready to satisfy the extreme curiosity which it has inspired. In fact, it is no more than the duty of him who achieves greatness to leave behind him in his ascent such landmarks as may guide others to be great. I propose, therefore, in the present paper, which I had some idea of calling Memoranda to serve for the literary history of America, to give a detail of those important yet feeble and tottering first steps, by which at length I attained the high road to the pinnacle of human renown. Of one's very remote ancestors it is superfluous to say much. My father, Thomas Bob, Esquire, stood for many years at the summit of his profession, which was that of a merchant barber in the city of Smug. His warehouse was the resort of all the principal people of the place, and especially of the editorial corps, a body which inspires all about it with profound veneration and awe. For my own part I regarded them as gods, and drank in with avidity the rich wit and wisdom which continuously flowed from their august mouths during the process of what is styled lather. My first moment of positive inspiration must be dated from that ever-memorable epoch, when the brilliant conductor of the gadfly, in the intervals of the important process just mentioned, recited aloud before a conclave of our apprentices an inimitable poem in honor of the only genuine oil of Bob so called from its talented inventor my father and for which effusion the editor of the fly was remunerated with a regal liberality by the firm of thomas bob and company merchant barbers the genius of the stanzas to the oil of bob first breathed into me i say the divine afflatus i resolved at once to become a great man and to commence by becoming a great poet that very evening i fell upon my knees at the feet of my father father i said pardon me but I have a soul above lather. It is my firm intention to cut the shop. I would be an editor. I would be a poet. I would pen stanzas to the oil of Bob. Pardon me and aid me to be great. My dear Thingham, replied my father. I had been christened Thingham after a wealthy relative so surnamed. My dear Thingham, he said, raising me from my knees by the ears. Thingham, my boy, you're a trump, and take after your father in having a soul. You have an immense head, too, and it must hold a great many brains. This I have long seen, and therefore had thoughts of making you a lawyer. The business, however, has grown ungenteel, and that of a politician don't pay. Upon the whole you judge wisely, the trade of editor is best. And if you can be a poet at the same time, as most of the editors are, by the by, why, you will kill two birds with one stone. To encourage you in the beginning of things, I will allow you a garret, pen, ink and paper, a rhyming dictionary, and a copy of the gadfly. I suppose you would scarcely demand any more. I would be an ungrateful villain if I did, I replied with enthusiasm. Your generosity is boundless. I will repay it by making you the father of a genius. Thus ended my conference with the best of men, and immediately upon its termination I betook myself with zeal to my poetical labors, as upon these, chiefly, I founded my hopes of ultimate elevation to the editorial chair. In my first attempts at composition, I found the stanzas to the oil of Bob rather a drawback than otherwise. Their splendor dazzled more than they enlightened me. The contemplation of their excellence tended naturally to discourage me, by comparison with my own abortions, so that for a long time I labored in vain. At length there came into my head one of those exquisitely original ideas which now and then will permeate the brain of a man of genius. It was this, or rather, thus was it carried into execution. From the rubbish of an old bookstall in a very remote corner of the town, I got together several antique and altogether unknown or forgotten volumes. The bookseller sold them to me for a song. From one of these, which purported to be a translation of one Dante's Inferno, 
I copied with remarkable neatness a long passage about a man named Ugolino, who had a parcel of brats. From another, which contained a good many old plays by some person whose name I forget, I extracted in the same manner and with the same care a great number of lines about angels and ministers saying grace and goblins damned and more besides of that sort. From a third, which was a composition of some blind man or other, either a Greek or a Choctaw, I cannot be at pains of remembering every trifle exactly. I took about fifty verses beginning with Achilles' wrath and Greece and something else. From a fourth, which I recollect was also the work of a blind man, I selected a page or two all about hail and holy light. And although a blind man has no business to write about light, still the verses were sufficiently good in their way. Having made fair copies of these poems, I signed every one of them Opodeldoc, a fine sonorous name. And doing each up nicely in a separate envelope, I dispatched one to each of the four principal magazines, with a request for speedy insertion and prompt pay. The result of this well-conceived plan, however, the success of which would have saved me much trouble in after life, served to convince me that some editors are not to be bamboozled, and gave the coup de grace, as they say in France, to my nascent hopes, as they say in the city of the Transcendentals. The fact is that each and every one of the magazines in question gave Mr. Opodeldoc a complete using up in the monthly notices to correspondence. The humdrum gave him a dressing after this fashion. Opodeldoc, whoever he is, has sent us a long tirade concerning a bedlamite whom he styles Ugolino, who had a great many children that should have been all whipped and sent to bed without their suppers. The whole affair is exceedingly tame, not to say flat. Opodeldoc, whoever he is, is entirely devoid of imagination, and imagination, in our humble opinion, is not only the soul of poesy, but also its very heart. Opodeldoc, whoever he is, has the audacity to demand of us for his twaddle a speedy insertion and prompt pay. We neither insert nor purchase any stuff of the sort. There can be no doubt, however, that he would meet with a ready sale for all the balderdash he can scribble at the office of either the rowdy dow, the lollipop, or the goosterum foodle. All this, it must be acknowledged, was very severe upon Opodeldoc, but the unkindest cut was putting the word poesy in small caps. In those five preeminent letters, what a world of bitterness is there not involved. But Opodeldoc was punished with equal severity in the rowdy dow, which spoke thus. We have received a most singular and insolent communication from a person, whoever he is, signing himself Opodeldoc, thus desecrating the greatness of the illustrious Roman emperor so named. Accompanying the letter of Opodeldoc, whoever he is, we find sundry lines of most disgusting and unmeaning rant about angels and ministers of grace, rant such as no madman short of a Nat Lee or an Opodeldoc could possibly perpetrate. And for this trash of trash we are modestly requested to pay promptly. No, sir, no, we pay for nothing of that sort. Apply to the humdrum, the lollipop, or the goosterum foodle. These periodicals will undoubtedly accept any literary offal you may send them, and as undoubtedly promise to pay for it. This was bitter indeed upon poor Opodeldoc, but in this instance the weight of the satire falls upon the humdrum, the lollipop, and the goosterum foodle, who are pungently styled periodicals, in italics, too, a thing that must have cut them to the heart. Scarcely less savage was the lollipop which thus discoursed. Some individual who rejoices in the appellation Opodeldoc, to what low uses are the names of the illustrious dead too often applied, has enclosed us some fifty or sixty verses commencing after this fashion. Achilles' wrath to grease the direful spring of woes unnumbered, etc., 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 etc. Opodeldoc, whoever he is, is respectfully informed that there is not a printer's devil in our office who is not in the daily habit of composing better lines. Those of Opodeldoc will not scan. Opodeldoc should learn to count. But why he should have received the idea that we, of all others, we would disgrace our pages with his ineffable nonsense is utterly beyond comprehension. Why the absurd twaddle is scarcely good enough for the humdrum, the rowdy dow, the goosterum foodle, things that are in the practice of publishing Mother Goose's melodies as original lyrics. And Opodeldoc, whoever he is, has even the assurance to demand pay for this drivel. Does Opodeldoc, whoever he is, know, is he aware that we could not be paid to insert it? As I perused this, I felt myself growing gradually smaller and smaller, and when I came to the point at which the editor sneered at the poem as verses, 
there was little more than an ounce of me left. As for Opital Doc, I began to experience compassion for the poor fellow. But the Goosterum Foodle showed, if possible, less mercy than the lollipop. It was the Goosterum Foodle that said, A wretched poetaster who signs himself Opital Doc is silly enough to fancy that we will print and pay for a medley of incoherent and ungrammatical bombast which he has transmitted to us, and which commences with the following most intelligible line. Hail, holy light, offspring of heaven, firstborn. We say most intelligible. Opital Doc, whoever he is, will be kind enough to tell us perhaps how hail can be holy light. We always regarded it as frozen rain. Will he inform us also how frozen rain can be at one and the same time both holy light, whatever that is, and an offspring, which latter term, if we understand anything about English, is only employed with propriety in reference to small babies of about six weeks old. But it is preposterous to descant upon such absurdity, although Opital Doc, whoever he is, has the unparalleled effrontery to suppose that we will not only insert his ignorant ravings, but absolutely pay for them. Now this is fine, it is rich, and we have half a mind to punish this young scribbler for his egotism by really publishing his effusion verbatim et literatim as he has written it. We could inflict no punishment so severe, and we would inflict it, but for the boredom which we should cause our readers in so doing. Let Opital Doc, whoever he is, send any future composition of like character to the humdrum, the lollipop, or the rowdy dow. They will insert it. They insert every month just such stuff. Send it to them. We are not to be insulted with impunity. This made an end of me. As for the humdrum, the rowdy dow, and the lollipop, I never could comprehend how they survived it. The putting them in the smallest possible minion, that was the rub, thereby insinuating their lowness, their baseness, while we stood looking down upon them in gigantic capitals. Oh, it was too bitter. It was wormwood. It was gall. Had I been either of those periodicals, I would have spared no pains to have the Goosterum Foodle prosecuted. It might have been done under the Act for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. As for Opital Doc, whoever he was, I had by this time lost all patience with the fellow, and sympathized with him no longer. He was a fool beyond doubt, whoever he was, and got not a kick more than he deserved. The result of my experiment with the old books convinced me, in the first place, that honesty is the best policy, and, in the second, that if I could not write better than Mr. Dante and the two blind men, and the rest of the old set, it would at least be a difficult matter to write worse. I took heart, therefore, and determined to prosecute the entirely original, as they say on the covers of the magazines, at whatever cost of study and pains. I again placed before my eyes, as a model, the brilliant stanzas on the oil of Bob by the editor of The Gadfly, and resolved to construct an ode on the same sublime theme, in rivalry of what had already been done. With my first verse I had no material difficulty. It ran thus. To pen an ode upon the oil of Bob. Having carefully looked out, however, all the legitimate rhymes to Bob, I found it impossible to proceed. In this dilemma I had recourse to paternal aid, and after some hours of mature thought, my father and I thus constructed the poem. To pen an ode upon the oil of Bob is all sorts of a job. Signed, Snob. To be sure, this composition was of no very great length, but I have yet to learn, as they say in the Edinburgh Review, that the mere extent of a literary work has anything to do with its merit. As for the quarterly cant about sustained effort, it is impossible to see the sense of it. Upon the whole, therefore, I was satisfied with the success of my maiden attempt, and now the only question regarded the disposal I should make of it. My father suggested that I should send it to the gadfly, but there were two reasons which operated to prevent me from so doing. I dreaded the jealousy of the editor, and I had ascertained that he did not pay for original contributions. I therefore, after due deliberation, consigned the article to the more dignified pages of the lollipop, and awaited the event in anxiety, but with resignation. In the very next published number I had the proud satisfaction of seeing my poem printed at length as the leading article, with the following significant words prefixed in italics and between brackets. We call the attention of our readers to the subjoined admirable stanzas on the oil of Bob. We need say nothing of their sublimity or of their pathos. It is impossible to peruse them without tears. Those who have been nauseated with a sad dose on the same August topic from the goose quill of the editor of the Gadfly will do well to compare the two compositions. P.S. We are consumed with anxiety to probe the mystery which envelops the pseudonym Snob. 
May we hope for a personal interview? All this was scarcely more than justice, but it was, I confess, rather more than I had expected. I acknowledge this, be it observed, to the everlasting disgrace of my country and of mankind. I lost no time, however, in calling upon the editor of the Lollipop, and had the good fortune to find this gentleman at home. He saluted me with an air of profound respect, slightly blended with a fatherly and patronizing admiration, brought in him, no doubt, by my appearance of extreme youth and inexperience. Begging me to be seated, he entered at once upon the subject of my poem. But modesty will ever forbid me to repeat the thousand compliments which he lavished upon me. The eulogies of Mr. Crabbe, such was the editor's name, were, however, by no means fulsomely indiscriminate. He analyzed my composition with much freedom and great ability, not hesitating to point out a few trivial defects, a circumstance which elevated him highly in my esteem. The gadfly was, of course, brought upon the tappy, and I hope never to be subjected to a criticism so searching or to rebukes so withering as were bestowed by Mr. Crabbe upon that unhappy effusion. I had been accustomed to regard the editor of the gadfly as something superhuman, but Mr. Crabbe soon disabused me of that idea. He set the literary as well as the personal character of the fly, so Mr. C. satirically designated the rival editor, in its true light. He, the fly, was very little better than he should be. He had written infamous things. He was a penny a liner and a buffoon. He was a villain. He had composed a tragedy which set the whole country in a guffaw, and a farce which deluged the universe in tears. Besides all this, he had the impudence to pen what he meant for a lampoon upon himself, Mr. Crabbe, and the temerity to style him an ass. Should I at any time wish to express my opinion of Mr. Fly, the pages of the lollipop, Mr. Crabbe assured me, were at my unlimited disposal. In the meantime, as it was very certain that I would be attacked in the fly for my attempt at composing a rival poem on the oil of Bob, he, Mr. Crabbe, would take it upon himself to attend pointedly to my private and personal interests. If I were not made a man of at once, it should not be the fault of himself, Mr. Crabbe. Mr. Crabbe, having now paused in his discourse, the latter portion of which I found it impossible to comprehend, I ventured to suggest something about the remuneration which I had been taught to expect for my poem, by an announcement on the cover of the lollipop, declaring that it, the lollipop, insisted upon being permitted to pay exorbitant prices for all accepted contributions, frequently expending more money for a single brief poem than the annual cost of the humdrum, the rowdy dow, and the goose-thrum foodle combined. As I mentioned the word remuneration, Mr. Crabbe first opened his eyes, and then his mouth, to quite a remarkable extent, causing his personal appearance to resemble that of a highly agitated elderly duck in the act of quacking and in this condition he remained, ever and anon pressing his hands tightly to his forehead, as if in a state of desperate bewilderment, until I had nearly made an end of what I had to say. Upon my conclusion he sank back in his seat as if much overcome, letting his arms fall lifelessly by his side, but keeping his mouth still rigorously open after the fashion of the duck. While I remained in speechless astonishment to behavior so alarming, he suddenly leapt to his feet and made a rush at the bell-rope but just as he reached this he appeared to have altered his intention, whatever it was, for he dived under a table and immediately reappeared with a cudgel. This he was in the act of uplifting, for what purpose I am at a loss to imagine, when, all at once, there came a benign smile over his features, and he sank placidly back in his chair. "'Mr. Bob,' he said, for I had sent up my cart before ascending myself. "'Mr. Bob, you are a young man, I presume. Very?' I assented adding that I had not yet concluded my third lustrum. Ah, he replied, very good. I see how it is. Say no more. Touching this matter of compensation, what you observe is very just. In fact, it is excessively so. But, uh, ah, uh, the first contribution. The first, I say. It is never the magazine custom to pay for. You comprehend, eh? The truth is, we are usually the recipients in such case. Mr. Crabbe smiled blandly as he emphasized the word recipients. For the most part, we are paid for the insertion of a maiden attempt, especially in verse. In the second place, Mr. Bob, the magazine rule is never to disperse what we term in France the argent comptant. I have no doubt you understand. In a quarter or two after the publication of the article, or in a year or two, we make no objection to giving our note at nine months, provided always that we can so arrange our affairs as to be quite certain of a burst-up in six. I really do hope, Mr. Bob that you will look upon this explanation as satisfactory. Here Mr. Crabbe concluded, 
and the tears stood in his eyes. Grieved to the soul at having been, however innocently, the cause of pain to so eminent and so sensitive a man, I hastened to apologize, and to reassure him by expressing my perfect coincidence with his views, as well as my entire appreciation of the delicacy of his position. Having done all this in a neat speech, I took leave. One fine morning, very shortly afterwards, I awoke and found myself famous. The extent of my renown will be best estimated by reference to the editorial opinions of the day. These opinions, it will be seen, were embodied in critical notices of the number of the lollipop containing my poem, and are perfectly satisfactory, conclusive, and clear, with the exception, perhaps, of the hieroglyphical marks September 15, 1T, appended to each of the critiques. The Owl a journal of profound sagacity, and well known for the deliberate gravity of its literary decisions. The Owl, I say, spoke as follows. The Lollipop, the October number of this delicious magazine, surpasses its predecessors. It sets competition at defiance. In the beauty of its topography and paper, in the number and excellence of its steel plates, as well as in the literary merit of its contributions, the Lollipop compares with its slow-paced rivals as Hyperion with a satyr, the humdrum, the rowdy dow, and the goose-thrum food will excel, it is true, in braggadocio. But in all other points, give us the lollipop. How this celebrated journal can sustain its evidently tremendous expenses is more than we can understand. To be sure, it has a circulation of 100,000, and its subscription list has increased one-fourth during the last month. But on the other hand, the sums it disperses constantly for contributions are inconceivable, it is reported that Mr. Slyus received no less than thirty-seven and a half cents for his inimitable paper on pigs. With Mr. Crabbe as editor, and with such names upon the list of contributors as Snob and Slyus, there can be no such word as fail for the lollipop. Go and subscribe. September 15, one t. I must say that I was gratified with this high-toned notice from a paper so respectable as the Owl. The placing my name, that is to say, my nom de guerre, in priority of station to that of the great Slyus, was a compliment as happy as I felt it to be deserved. My attention was next arrested by these paragraphs in The Toad, a print highly distinguished for its uprightness and independence, for its entire freedom from sycophancy and subservience to the givers of dinners. The lollipop for October is out in advance of all its contemporaries, and infinitely surpasses them, of course, in the splendor of its embellishments, as well as in the richness of its literary contents. The humdrum, the rowdy dow, and the goosterum foodle excel, we admit, in braggadocio. But in all other points, give us the lollipop. How this celebrated magazine can sustain its evidently tremendous expenses is more than we can understand. To be sure, it has a circulation of 200,000, and its subscription list has increased one-third in the last fortnight. But, on the other hand, the sums it disperses monthly for contributions are fearfully great, we learn that Mr. Mumblethumb received no less than fifty cents for his late monody in a mud puddle. Among the original contributors to the present number we notice, besides the eminent editor, Mr. Crabbe, such men as Snob, Slyus, and Mumblethumb. Apart from the editorial matter, the most valuable paper, nevertheless, is, we think, a poetical gem by Snob on the oil of Bob. But our readers must not suppose from the title of this incomparable bijou that it bears any similitude to some balderdash on the same subject by a certain contemptible individual whose name is unmentionable to ears polite. The present poem, On the Oil of Bob, has excited universal anxiety and curiosity in respect to the owner of the evident pseudonym, Snob, a curiosity which, happily, we have it in our power to satisfy. Snob is the nom de plume of Mr. Thingam Bob of this city, a relative of the great Mr. Thingham, after whom he is named, and otherwise connected with the most illustrious families of the state. His father, Thomas Bob Esquire, is an opulent merchant in Smug. September 15, 1 T. This generous approbation touched me to the heart, the more especially as it emanated from the source so avowedly, so proverbially pure as the toad. The word balderdash, as applied to the oil of Bob of the fly, I considered singularly pungent and appropriate. The words gem and bijou, however, used in reference to my composition, struck me as being in some degree feeble. They seemed to me to be deficient in force. They were not proficiently prononcé, as we have it in France. I had hardly finished reading The Toad when a friend placed in my hands a copy of The Mole, 
a daily, enjoying high reputation for the keenness of its perception about matters in general, and for the open, honest, above-ground style of its editorials. The Mole spoke of the lollipop as follows. We have just received the lollipop for October, and must say that never before have we perused any single number of any periodical which afforded us a felicity so supreme. We speak advisedly. The humdrum, the rowdy dow, and the goose room foodle must look well to their laurels. These prints no doubt surpass everything in loudness of pretension, but in all other points give us the lollipop. How this celebrated magazine can sustain its evidently tremendous expenses is more than we can comprehend. To be sure, it has a circulation of 300,000, and its subscription list has increased one-half within the last week. But then the sum it disperses monthly for contributions is astoundingly enormous. We have it upon good authority that Mr. Fat Quack received no less than 62 cents and a half for his late domestic nouvellette, The Dish Clout. The contributors to the number before us are Mr. Crab, the eminent editor, Snob, Mumblethumb, Fat Quack, and others. But after the inimitable compositions of the editor himself, we prefer a diamond-like effusion from the pen of a rising poet who writes over the signature Snob, a nom de guerre which we predict will one day extinguish the radiance of Boz. Snob, we learn, is a Thingam Bob Esquire, sole heir of a wealthy merchant of this city, Thomas Bob Esquire, and a near relative of the distinguished Mr. Thingam. The title of Mr. B.'s admirable poem is The Oil of Bob, a somewhat unfortunate name, by the by, as some contemptible vagabond connected with the penny press has already disgusted the town with a great deal of drivel upon the same topic. There will be no danger, however, of confounding the compositions. September 15, 1T The generous approbation of so clear-sighted a journal as the Mole penetrated my soul with delight. The only objection which occurred to me was that the terms contemptible vagabond might have been better written odious and contemptible, wretched villain and vagabond. This would have sounded more gracefully, I think. Diamond-like, also, was scarcely, it will be admitted, of sufficient intensity to express what the Mole evidently thought of the brilliancy of the oil of Bob. On the same afternoon in which I saw these notices in the Owl, the Toad, and the Mole, I happened to meet with a copy of the Daddy Longlegs, a periodical proverbial for the extreme extent of its understanding. And it was the Daddy Longlegs which spoke thus. The Lollipop! This gorgeous magazine is already before the public for October. The question of preeminence is forever put to rest, and hereafter it will be excessively preposterous in the humdrum, the rowdy dow, or the goose room foodle to make any farther spasmodic attempts at competition. These journals may excel the lollipop in outcry, but in all other points give us the lollipop. How this celebrated magazine can sustain its evidently tremendous expenses is past comprehension. To be sure, it has a circulation of precisely half a million, and its subscription list has increased 75% within the last couple of days. But then the sums it disperses monthly for contributions are scarcely credible. We are cognizant of the fact that Mademoiselle Cribbelittle received no less than 87 cents and a half for her late valuable revolutionary tale entitled The Yorktown Katie Did and The Bunker Hill Katie Didn't. The most stable papers in the present number are, of course, those furnished by the editor, the eminent Mr. Crabb. But there are numerous magnificent contributions from such names as Snob, Mademoiselle Cribbelittle, Slyus, Mrs. Fibbelittle, Mumblethumb, Mrs. Squibbelittle, and last, though not least, Fat Quack. The world may well be challenged to produce so rich a galaxy of genius. The poem over the signature Snob is, we find, attracting universal commendation, and, we are constrained to say, deserves, if possible, even more applause than it has received. The Oil of Bob is the title of this masterpiece of eloquence and art. One or two of our readers may have a very faint, although sufficiently disgusting, recollection of a <clears throat> poem similarly entitled, The Perpetration of a Miserable Penny-Aligner Mendicant and Cutthroat, connected in the capacity of Scullion, we believe with one of the indecent prints about the purlieus of the city. We beg them not to confound the compositions. The author of The Oil of Bob is, we hear, Thingambob Esquire, a gentleman of high genius and a scholar. Snob is merely a nom de guerre. September 15, one t. I could scarcely restrain my indignation while I perused the concluding portions of this diatribe. It was clear to me that the yea-nay manner, not to mention the gentleness, 
the positive forbearance with which the daddy longlegs spoke of that pig the editor of the gadfly it was evident to me i say that this gentleness of speech could proceed from nothing else than a partiality for the fly whom it was clearly the intention of the daddy longlegs to elevate into reputation at my expense any one indeed might perceive with half an eye that had the real design of the daddy been what it wished to appear it the daddy might have expressed itself in terms more direct more pungent and altogether more to the purpose the words penny a liner mendicant scullion and cutthroat were epithets so intentionally inexpressive and equivocal as to be worse than nothing when applied to the author of the very worst stanzas ever penned by one of the human race we all know what is meant by damning with faint praise and on the other hand who could fail to see through the covert purpose of the daddy that of glorifying with feeble abuse what the daddy chose to say of the fly however was no business of mine what it said of myself was after the noble manner in which the owl the toad the mole had expressed themselves in respect to my ability it was rather too much to be coolly spoken of by a thing like the daddy longlegs as merely a gentleman of high genius and a scholar gentleman indeed i made up my mind at once either to get a written apology from the daddy longlegs or to call it out for this purpose i looked about me to find a friend whom i can entrust with a message to his daddy ship and as the editor of the lollipop had given me marked tokens of regard i at length concluded to seek assistance upon the present occasion i have never yet been able to account in the manner satisfactory to my own understanding for the very peculiar countenance and demeanour with which mr crabbe listened to me as i unfolded to him my design he again went through the scene of the bell-rope and the cudgel and did not omit the duck at one period i thought he really intended to quack his fit nevertheless finally subsided as before and he began to act and speak in a rational way he declined bearing the cartel however and in fact dissuaded me from sending it at all but was candid enough to admit that the daddy longlegs had been disgracefully in the wrong more especially in what related to the epithets gentleman and scholar toward the end of this interview with mr crabbe who really appeared to take a paternal interest in my welfare he suggested to me that i might turn an honest penny and at the same time advance my reputation by occasionally playing thomas hawk for the lollipop i begged mr crabbe to inform me who was mr thomas hawk and how it was expected that i should play him here mr crabbe again made great eyes as we say in germany but at length recovering himself from a profound attack of astonishment he assured me that he employed the words thomas hawk to avoid the colloquialism tommy which was low but that the true idea was tommy hawk or tomahawk and that by playing tomahawk he referred to scalping browbeating and otherwise using up the herd of poor devil authors i assured my patron that if this was all i was perfectly resigned to the task of playing thomas hawk hereupon mr crabbe desired me to use up the editor of the gadfly forthwith in the fiercest style within the scope of my ability and as a specimen of my power this i did upon the spot in a review of the original oil of bob occupying thirty-six pages of the lollipop i found playing thomas hawk indeed a far less onerous occupation than poetizing for i went upon system altogether and thus it was easy to do the thing thoroughly and well my practice was this i bought auction copies cheap of lord brogan's speeches cobet's complete works the new slang syllabus the whole art of snubbing prentice's billingsgate folio edition and lewis g clark on tongue these works i cut up thoroughly with a curry comb and then throwing the shreds into a sieve shifted out carefully all that might be thought decent a mere trifle reserving the hard phrases which i threw into a large tin pepper caster with longitudinal holes so that an entire sentence could get through without material injury the mixture was then ready to use when called upon to play thomas hawk i anointed a sheet of fool's cap with the white of a gander's egg then shredding the thing to be reviewed as i had previously shredded the books only with more care so as to get every word separate i threw the latter shreds in with the former screwed on the lid of the caster gave it a shake and so dusted out the mixture upon the egged fool's cap where it stuck the effect was beautiful to behold it was captivating indeed the reviews i brought to pass by this simple expedient have never been approached and were the wonder of the world at first through bashfulness the result of inexperience i was a little put out by a certain inconsistency a certain air of the bazaar as we say in france warm by the composition as a whole all the phrases did not fit as we say in the anglo-saxon many were quite awry some even were upside down 
and there were none of them which were not in some measure injured in regard to effect by this latter species of accident when it occurred with the exception of mr lewis clark's paragraphs which were so vigorous and altogether stout that they seemed not particularly disconcerted by any extreme opposition but looked equally happy and satisfactory whether on their heads or on their heels what became of the editor of the gadfly after the publication of my criticism on his oil of bob is somewhat difficult to determine the most reasonable conclusion is that he wept himself to death at all events he disappeared instantaneously from the face of the earth and no man has seen even the ghost of him since this matter having been properly accomplished and the furies appeased i grew at once into high favor with mr crabbe he took me into his confidence gave me a permanent situation as thomas hawk of the lollipop and as for the present he could afford me no salary allowed me to profit at discretion by his advice my dear thingam said he to me one day after dinner i respect your abilities and love you as a son you shall be my heir when i die i will bequeath you the lollipop in the meantime i will make a man of you i will provided always that you follow my counsel the first thing to do is to get rid of the old boar boar said i inquiringly pig eh Aper, as we say in latin who where your father said he precisely i replied pig you have your fortune to make thingam resumed mr crabbe and that governor of yours is a millstone about your neck we must cut him at once here i took out my knife we must cut him continued mr crabbe decidedly and forever he won't do he won't upon second thoughts you had better kick him or cane him or something of that kind what do you say i suggested modestly to my kicking him in the first instance caning him afterwards and winding up by tweaking his nose mr crabbe looked at me musingly for some moments and then answered i think mr bob that what you proposed would answer sufficiently well indeed remarkably well that is to say as far as it went but barbers are exceedingly hard to cut and i think upon the whole that having performed upon thomas bob the operations you suggest it would be advisable to blacken with your fists both his eyes very carefully and thoroughly to prevent his ever seeing you again in fashionable promenades after doing this i really do not perceive that you can do any more however it might be just as well to roll him once or twice in the gutter and then to put him in charge of the police any time the next morning you can call at the watch-house and swear an assault i was much affected by the kindness of feeling towards me personally which was evinced in this excellent advice of mr crab and i did not fail to profit by it forthwith the result was that i got rid of the old boar and began to feel a little independent and gentlemanlike the want of money however was for a few weeks a source of some discomfort but at length by carefully putting to use my two eyes and observing how matters went just in front of my nose i perceived how the thing was to be brought about i say thing be it observed for they tell me the latin for it is rem by the way talking of latin can any one tell me the meaning of quocunque or what is the meaning of modo my plan was exceedingly simple i bought for a song a sixteenth of the snapping turtle that was all the thing was done and i put money in my purse there were some trivial arrangements afterwards to be sure but these formed no portion of the plan they were a consequence a result for example i bought pen ink and paper and put them into furious activity having thus completed a magazine article i gave it for appellation fall lol by the author of the oil of bob and enveloped it to the goosetherum foodle that journal however having pronounced it twaddle in the monthly notices to correspondence i reheaded the paper hey diddle diddle by thingam bob esq author of the ode on the oil of bob and editor of the snapping turtle with this amendment i re-enclosed it to the goosetherum foodle and while i awaited a reply published daily in the turtle six columns of what may be termed philosophical and analytical investigation of the literary merits of the goosetherum foodle as well as the personal character of the editor of the goosetherum foodle at the end of a week the goosetherum foodle discovered that it had by some odd mistake confounded a stupid article headed hey diddle diddle and composed by some unknown ignoramus with a gem of splendid lustre similarly entitled the work of thingambob esq the celebrated author of oil of bob the goosetherum foodle deeply regretted this very natural accident and promised moreover an insertion of the genuine hey diddle diddle in the very next number of the magazine the fact is i thought i really thought i thought at the time i thought then and have no reason for thinking otherwise now 
that the Goose Room Foodle did make a mistake. With the best intentions in the world, I never knew anything that made as many singular mistakes as the Goose Room Foodle. From that day I took a liking to the Goose Room Foodle, and the result was I soon saw into the very depths of its literary merits, and did not fail to expatiate upon them in the turtle whenever a fitting opportunity occurred. And it is to be regarded as a very peculiar coincidence, as one of those positively remarkable coincidences which set a man to serious thinking, that just such a total revolution of opinion, just such entire bouleversement, as we say in French, just such thorough topsy-turviness, if I may be permitted to employ a rather forcible term of Choctaws, as happened pro and con between myself on the one part and the Goosterum Foodle on the other, did actually again happen in a brief period afterwards, and with precisely similar circumstances, in the case of myself and the Rowdy Dow, and in the case of myself and the Humdrum. Thus it was that, by a master stroke of genius, I at length consummated my triumphs by putting money in my purse, and thus may be said really and fairly to have commenced that brilliant and eventful career which rendered me illustrious, and which now enables me to say, with Chateaubriand, I have made history. J'ai fait l'histoire. I have indeed made history. From the bright epoch which I now record, my actions, my works, are the property of mankind. They are familiar to the world. It is then needless for me to detail how, soaring rapidly, I fell heir to the lollipop, how I merged this journal in the humdrum, how again I made purchase of the rowdy dow, thus combining the three periodicals, how, lastly, I effected a bargain for the sole remaining rival, and united all the literature of the country in one magnificent magazine, known everywhere as the rowdy dow, lollipop, humdrum, and goosterum foodle. Yes, I have made history. My fame is universal. It extends to the uttermost ends of the earth. You cannot take up a common newspaper in which you shall not see some allusion to the immortal Thingumbob. It is Mr. Thingumbob said so, and Mr. Thingumbob wrote this, and Mr. Thingumbob did that. But I am meek, and expire with an humble heart. After all, what is it, this indescribable something which men will persist in terming genius? I agree with Buffon, with Hogarth, it is but diligence, after all. Look at me, how I labored, how I toiled, how I wrote. Ye gods, did I not write? I knew not the word ease. By day I adhered to my desk, and at night, a pale student, I consumed the midnight oil. You should have seen me. You should. I leaned to the right. I leaned to the left. I sat forward. I sat backward. I sat upon end. I sat tête basse, as they have it in the Kickapoo bowing my head close to the alabaster page, and through it all I wrote. Through joy and through sorrow I wrote. Through hunger and through thirst I wrote. Through good report and ill report I wrote. Through sunshine and through moonshine I wrote. What I wrote is unnecessary to say. The style, that was the thing. I caught it from fat quack. Whiz, fizz. And I am giving you a specimen of it now. End of The Literary Life of Thingumbob Esquire by Edgar Allan Poe